Uh, welcome to MIT Enterprise Forum of New York City panel. Um, before we jump into the main event, we would like to tell you a little bit about us, MIT Enterprise Forum of New York. We are a global nonprofit, um, and the New York chapter is dedicated to the innovation hub in the New York area. We organize monthly thought leadership events on a wide range of topics, from AI to cybersecurity to even drones. We also provide resources such as workshops for local technologists and entrepreneurs. You can learn more about us and how to become a member on our website. We hope you will enjoy today's event and looking forward to seeing you at our future events. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Francesco Correa. Francesco is a research lead at VC firm Belderton Capital in London. Prior to Belderton, Francesco helped a number of AI startups ramp up operations and worked with small financial boutiques on venture strategies. Francesco has a Bachelor's of Science in Management, a Master's of Science in Economics, a second Master's of Science in Finance, and a PhD in Economics. He also did a postdoctoral research on AI and risk management and published several academic peer-reviewed articles and books. Erica Van. Erica is an investor at Charles River Ventures, a coast-to-coast -coast venture capital firm that has invested in hundreds of startups over the past 50 years. Prior to joining CRV, Erica was an investor at Presidio Partners, focusing on frontier tech. Prior to that, Erica was, the, was at JP Morgan, where she co-founded a strategy team. Senefer Mendoza. Senefer is a founder and general partner of Mendoza Ventures, a Boston-based pre-seed fintech AI and cybersecurity venture capital firm. She began Mendoza Ventures to address the growing funding gap in the pre-seed investment stage. She's a published author, innovator, and thought leader in the technology, startup, and VC space with a passion for equity and diversity. Josh Amster. Josh is one of Start Engine's first employees. Josh has built and developed the sales and service department from the ground up. Prior to Start Engine, he worked as sales and business development executive at the sports and entertainment conglomerate, AEG. Start Engine's mission is to democratize access to capital and help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams. Michael Berto. Michael is a serial entrepreneur that has led multiple startups from zero to millions in dollars in revenue and millions of dollars in funding including raising millions through various forms of crowdfunding. His work has been featured on the cover of Time magazine, has been the subject of mini documentaries by the Discovery Channel and CNN's Great Big Story, and has appeared on ABC's Shark Tank. He is the inventor of the Geo-Orbital Wheel, a Time magazine invention of the year for 2019. John Parthorn. John is the founder and former CEO of Math Challenge, the most startup-friendly accelerator on the planet. To date, about 2,500 Math Challenge alumni have raised over six billion of funding, have generated over three billion of revenue, and have created over 157,000 jobs. The World Economic Forum elected John as one of the 2013 Young Global Leaders, and Ernst and Young selected John as Social Entrepreneur of the New of the year in New England for 2013. John stepped down as CEO of Math Challenge in 2019 to launch a seed fund to Lanterns Venture Partners. Okay, before we start our panel, let's have a high level overview of the current state of venture capital. So for that, I prepared a few slides and I will share my screen. <clears throat> So, so, um, so what happened before this, um, before COVID, just go step back a little bit to see where venture capital was as an industry. Uh, we've seen a real focus on very large size deals, even before COVID, right? You see that uh, if you look at the deals of 50 million plus and deals of 25 to 50 million, that's about 80% of all deal size of all investments that are done in 2019, right? That leaves a lot of early stage companies unfunded, right? Um, uh, so what are some of the reasons for this? Well, some of the reasons is you can't find a lot of fundable startups, right? 
Uh, we had twice as many businesses started during Carter administration than we have today. So innovation is not as um, uh, you know, uh, good as, as it used to be. And there are other investors that are actually inflating the deal size. For example, you have family offices, multifamily offices, single family offices, and um, high net worth individuals that are contributing to this. So that all raises the um, amounts of money invested and then pushes VCs to uh, chase bigger and bigger deals, which again leaves smaller um, startups uh, behind. Um, and you can see here in a, on a chart of 2015 to 2018, uh, just this the drop in number of deals done, again, because uh, there's um, you know, less fundable companies and larger funds are focusing much more on more mature investments. However, at the same time, um, historical VC returns are not spectacular, right? If you look at the long time horizon, uh, it doesn't look that great, right? Um, so, you know, when investors are expecting uh, returns, they have to deal with 10 year locks, and depending where they invested and when that lock ends, they could be getting a pretty good deal, like last year, 2019 was a good deal for investors, but then some, sometimes they may not get much. And so it's very uh, unstable in terms of returns, right? And all that on top of 2% um, uh, uh, management fee and 20% of carry that's given to VCs. Uh, when compared to the um, assets, other assets um, in terms of, uh, you know, on the risk adjusted basis, we see that the picture is even worse. Um, even private equity beats French capital long term, uh, which is a lower risk investment. Um, and then you can see that, you know, venture capital beats um, index fund S&P 500 by just a little bit, right? Um, so it is not a good picture for something that should be uh, returning um, high multiples. Uh, so let's look at the, what's going on today, right? We have Q2 of 2020 uh, versus Q2 20, 2019. In terms of deal, a volume of deals, it, it's uh, holding up pretty well, right? We still have uh, a large volume, but if you look at the number of deals, it has dropped a lot, right? Again, going back to that um, theme that, you know, the investors are chasing larger deals, follow-on deals, uh, and not uh, earlier stage deals. Um, if you look at the more granular level on these slides, you can see Q2 of 2020 versus Q2 of 2019. Uh, on the left slide, you can see just how little was invested, uh, was, was done in terms of first uh, time investments and how fewer deals you have in Q2 when compared to Q2 of 2019. Now, I like these slides when they say there's a good news, right? So I look at this, it says a quarterly rise in Q2 after a sharp decline. See deals, you know, uptick. So, but then I expanded that back to six years to see where it was back then. And it's almost half of what it used to be six years ago. So yes, even though we see some uptick, we, it's still almost just the really, really uh, a dramatic re reduction in, in terms of the number of deals, C deals, that we used to have just six years ago. So not a good picture. Um, picture gets even bleaker if you look at the geographical spread of investment, right? You look at the 80% um, goes to three states. It's just not sustainable. So can't, you know, um, see this uh, going forward in terms of other states and, and their ability to, to develop new companies and new industries. Uh, I'm curious how this is gonna change now that COVID has pushed a lot of people out of California into other states like uh, Idaho or Texas. And it will be interesting to see this chart in say five years um, and see if anything changed in terms of where the investments are made. So what are the alternatives? We see some serious issues. And one of the things that we're gonna be looking at this panel is using data-centric approach, machine learning and other te uh, techniques to um, aid venture capital industry, which traditionally has been stagnating in terms of operational efficiency and use of technology. So interesting examples for Veronica Wu, uh, partner at Hong Capital. Um, their algorithm was able to discover something that their intuition and experience was not able to. For example, they uh, found out that if you had two founders that both came from the same university, their chances of actually getting funded are very, very small versus the founders who came, both came from different universities. 
Another example she gave was um, if a company received half a million in funding, had lots smaller chances of getting to the next round than if you received one and a half million in funding, right? Um, uh, today, we're going to have uh, Francesco Cura talk about his research, and he's also been tracking a number of funds uh, that are using data-centric approach. Uh, from 15 funds um, that he tracked a year ago to 25 funds today, uh, it looks like the number of funds using data-centric approach is really increasing. One interesting example is SignalFire that raised about $500 million uh, in two funds, and um, they're using data-centric approach uh, for key hires and deals. Uh, so um, they will be interesting to watch. Um, there's also crowdfunding. Um, this, is this is a chart that projects crowdfunding to be 12 billion uh, in volume of investment by 2023. And I believe this number is actually small because I've seen what's happening during COVID and uh, this number should be much higher. Um, if you look at just uh, on this chart that uh, uh, Josh let me use uh, from Start Engine. Uh, in span of four months, the growth went 4x from uh, March to July, right? From two to eight million, um, you know, invested on their platform. So that's just staggering growth. These are staggering numbers that, um, and there's a definitely a, a, a seismic shift happening. Um, so I took a look at the, you know, in terms of growth rate between crowdfunding and VC, and um, I did calculus to, it shows me that uh, what took um, VC industry 15 years in terms of growth to achieve will take equity crowdfunding less than six years. So cannot be ignored. All right, so these are just kind of basic step, basic information and um, that will help us um, you know, get into the discussion. So right now I'd like to start with our first panelist, um, Francesco. Francesco, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. for example, um, you published an article in Forbes uh, that got a lot of attention. I read it. I really love the article. Um, and that was regarding your use of uh, machine learning in venture capital. Um, can you please give us a succinct description of your approach? And what are the most significant findings that came out of your work? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, like, thanks for having me and thanks like, for reading this article, Ned. Um, basically, like the, the, the way in which it all came up uh, a few years back was, uh, well, it was me like, simply working in this, in this space for a bit uh, and noticing that, especially like in terms of data and all those things, there is like, there is a clear gap when it comes to data analysis in VC. So like, that's, that's probably due because all this data are, uh, missing, poorly collected, especially at early stage, there is not like that much balance sheet data or income statement data. So you have to work with what you have, right? Uh, which might be funding information or more like descriptive stuff about like specific companies and so on and so forth. So the main, the main research question I had back then was, is that possible to use the data that we have to try to understand with variables, well, we have what, what type of variables are relevant to predict, and forgive me for what I'm uh, for what I'm going to say right now, but like to predict the probability of success of a company, which is of course, as you might imagine, is a super long shot. Uh, and uh, the the funny thing is that I myself I'm not completely sure that you can really predict success uh, because I mean like usually success means well it means first of all like different things to different people, right? So it might it might it might be creating, you know, like a great company or making huge revenues or like giving a job to thousands of employees or, you know, like having an impact. I mean, it really means different things to different people. And even like within like the VC space, uh, if you are an early stage fund, it might simply be that you get like your companies to a specific round of funding where you can sell in a second like market part of your portfolio or maybe like bring the company to an M&A or to an IPO. So that's really something that cause problem when, uh, when you try to model uh, like either machine learning or data science or analytics, call it whatever you feel like, by using some of these tools to predict this probability. And at the same time, it, it, it was honestly not, it was simply like a way for me and uh, for the people that I was working with to try to, like, to have an additional help when analyzing super early stage companies 
they were really like lacking data uh, by by definition, right? Uh, so some of the stuff that we have done, uh, you uh, you actually mentioned in uh, right. I mean, like, there is a, um, a short academic paper published online. Uh, it's it's free, so you can see that, comment it, read it. Uh, and uh, the, the approach there uh, was to simply get as much crunch-based data as possible and uh, trying to, uh, to create specific test, uh, a specific window testing uh, where you can actually uh, try to identify this variable and project this variable three years in the future and see what companies were still alive and to what, like, what, what kind of companies uh, were, 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 were still alive and in what condition, basically. And the, the finding, as you might expect, were uh, kind of mixed. So there was something coming out that was expected to some extent and something that was completely meaningless. Because unfortunately, sometimes, and well, meaningless from, a, from, from an economic point of view, uh, as, you, as you might expect, like these models sometimes give you answer that uh, they, might, they might be statistically relevant, but at the same time, they don't really make any sense from a practical point of view. So if you actually see those results, you will notice that, you know, there are variables like having telephone number or LinkedIn profile or whatever that are correlated to probability of success, which of course, if you want to, to justify those results, you can, you can build for yourself like whatever, you know, reasoning behind it. So you can say, okay, if a company has a LinkedIn profile, it's because it's more like it's it's more like outspoken. Uh, they do like better social campaigns or marketing or whatever, right? But it might simply be like as poor as correlation. So it might it might not mean anything. And honestly, I, I I doubt that having a LinkedIn profile means that you are more successful, right? Uh, so everything you do in this space, it, it has to be taken with uh, well, with some own, like some 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 wisdom. Let's put it in that way. Uh, and again. Another, another thing that I want to point out, because I mean, that's something that I think that right now is kind of becoming more common knowledge within investors, but the reality is that we like to talk about machine learning and data science applied to VC and whatever, but the reality is that there are very, very few people doing real machine learning stuff. And honestly, many of us, I mean, me included right now, we are not doing any like super cool machine learning things. It's mostly like automation stuff, honestly, like, so what we really want to achieve is finding ways that can make it our job as easy as possible, as smooth as possible, and trying to make like as automatic as possible to some extent, especially for like for funds that analyze like three, four thousand decks every year, which is uh, what right now is the market about. I don't know if that stimulates like extra thoughts for discussion. Um, I should probably like stop here to give you like some, some space. Matt, I think you're muted. Yeah, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much. I apologize. Uh, we're going to keep on with the um, other panelists, and we're going to come back and address some of the things you said, Francesca. Thank you. So we can give everyone uh, a chance to talk a little bit in, in the beginning before we have an open discussion. Uh, so Erica, um, I'd like to switch to you. Um, tell us more about all the ways your company uses data, uh, whether that be um, automation, algorithms, or something else. Um, uh, some, anything that you use to aid uh, your deal sourcing, um, due diligence, talent search, or whatever else you might be doing. Yeah, so um, we at CRV you know, certainly feel that data can supplement, but certainly not really replace finding kind of phenomenal companies and, and kind of the diligence. Um, we certainly rely very heavily on our network, our entrepreneurs, our industry expertise to find interesting um, kind of investments and, and conduct the diligence. But the ways that we do currently use data, um, similar to what was said before, it's a lot of kind of signal tracking on automation. So, you know, looking at GitHub stars, you know, analyzing a lot of crunch base and pitch book pulls, Slack engagement uh, is actually a new kind of metric that we're looking at pretty closely. We do a lot of market maps. We do a lot of looking at what's trending on Twitter, what's Google. We benchmark against a lot of companies, look at data like purchasing and mobile app data. Um, and, and actually, we use a lot of automation across LinkedIn data. So, you know, one example of a very generic, but something that can be a very powerful kind of pull is, you know, every time 
you know, a VP of engineering, uh, you know, a great company leaves and doesn't update where they're going many times, they're probably going to, you know, start a new company, um, or whatnot. So that type of tracking is something that we do, um, commonly. We look a lot at hiring and recruitment kind of, um, job recs that are out to see if, if companies are growing, um, anything to get a sense kind of more about the market. We, we have in the past kind of built scrapers and very light kind of algorithms to find, um, stuff but I, but I would say that a lot of it is is network driven and, and supplemented with with data as opposed to kind of the main channel. Do I think that we're moving towards a more data driven approach where it actually weighs in um, more on investing decisions for sure there's a lot of really interesting stuff that we're seeing in the market today that you know firms are doing uh, many newer firms are doing um, and they're getting in front of, of really interesting companies that sometimes we might not see. Um, but again, yes, for us, it's, it's relationship and network driven first and, and supplement with data. Great, thank you. Um, let's move to Josh. Uh, Josh, um, in the introduction, um, you know, I mentioned that crowdfunding is growing rapidly and I showed the slide that uh, you let me use, um, especially during this pandemic. Um, could you please paint uh, for us the journey Start Engine has been through over the past uh, five months? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Ned, thanks for having me as well. It's been a, quite a journey. Um, you know, I would say just the, the regulations that we operate under came into effect through the Jobs Act, which was signed into effect uh, back in 2012 um, in the President Obama administration. It was a bipartisan bill that was really going to democratize capital. And for the first several years, there was kind of interest in it and intrigue. But I would say most entrepreneurs and small businesses were a bit hesitant to get started in equity crowdfunding. And, and that has really shifted over the last two years, but significantly over the last several months during the pandemic. As that slide showed, you know, our platform as a, as a whole was raising around a million and a half to two million dollars a week for companies uh, across our platform. And that number has now surged to over six million dollars a week for companies on our platform and some may say well why the the sudden surge and i think there's many different reasons and explanations for it probably the some, the two that i think of top of mind are number one there are a enormous amount of small businesses out there that are desperate for cash and now so more than ever and as your slides were showing the number of these companies that are able to um, secure VC investment is declining. And the number of new companies getting first time institutional capital uh, or venture you know, capital is declining as well. And so these companies need, need capital. And so they're now turning to platforms like Start Engine and other mm -hmm. equity crowdfunding platforms to be able to access money from the general public. And you'll, you're seeing raises you know, $50 million or below um, some seed, some even Series A uh, offerings on our platform. So the quality of deal flow, deal flow is definitely increasing during this pandemic. I think you're also just seeing natural awareness about our space growing. Uh, if before, and I'm making up numbers here, about 20% of the population maybe knew about equity crowdfunding, Maybe that's now 35 to 40% of the population is now aware of it because of what's going on in this pandemic. So the education out there is getting better. The quality of companies coming to the platform are better. And the, you, know, you can see the number of investments on the platform are growing significantly. And you just signed up Kevin O'Leary. You had to have to be shy about that. That's that's pretty yeah, sad. that's true. I think he also helps spread the word a lot, and he's been he's a, a investor in our company. He's a paid advocate for us, and he's been you know beating the drum, talking about equity crowdfunding in our platform all over the place, and telling all of his portfolio companies to come to our platform to raise capital. So that that certainly helps as well. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> Let's move to Center for. Um, Another wave of change that we witnessed in the VC world, even before COVID, has been calls for much more board diversity, which COVID has given emphasis to. 
Um, your company is leading the way when it comes to diversity in venture capital. Um, please tell us how does your firm do that and what impact would uh, applying more data-centric approach have on your process? Yeah, um, well, we have a diverse GP team and it's really not rocket science, but <laughs> that's what we did <laughs> and we're getting recognized for it. Um, so all of our capital allocation decisions are made by women or people of color because that's who's on our GP team. And I think when we opened the firm, um, it was not part of our core mission. Our inclusivity has always been part of who we are, but that, that message has really found us because we got out here running the firm and realized that we did in fact look as different as everybody was telling us compared to the landscape of VC. Um, and in terms of incorporating data into that, it's been really interesting to see what different decks we get because we are founder operated and minority or female. So we just get a lot of entrepreneurs that are looking for investors that look more like them. Um, and so we get a more diverse subset of decks than a lot of traditional VCs do. Um, and then incorporating data into that, there's a lot of algorithmic funds that are, I feel like there's a new algorithm fund every year that's trying to incorporate data into the investment making decisions. And I, I agree with Erica that you need people on that team to cross check the algorithm and also to really look at that data set from a very analytical place because the history of VC doesn't even look like VC is starting to look like now. So if you're training up data on how you define success five years ago, the people making those investment decisions look different than they do now and so we haven't seen a really thoughtful intentional answer to how do you create an inclusive algorithm because who we invest in are all outliers they would never get caught in that algorithm um and and they're doing quite well so how do you find that has been a question that you know we'll probably keep francesco up at night for a while but we haven't heard a solid answer to that one yet okay thank you all right, let's go to Mike. Hey, Mike, um, you wrote a great article calling out the VC industry as uh, outdated um, and resistant to change, um, also showing the alternative, um, and for many startups, better ways to get funded. Um, so please tell us more about changes that you're expecting to see in the industry over the, say, next 10 years, and in what ways will a crowdfunding impact uh, that change? Yeah, I think, um, so actually, you know what? I do have a slide. It's very random, but do you mind if I share my screen? Okay. No All right, let me, let me just share a screen because I just coincidentally have a slide comparing uh, venture capital to equity crowdfunding, something I call EC, which I think might be good to kind of uh, set the tone a little bit because I think a lot of people might uh, not be aware of the differences between the two things. So just give me one second. Let me get through 30 seconds of technical issues that I'm having. All right. One second. And now I'm going to share my screen. Oh, can you enable me for screen sharing if you don't mind? While you're doing that, let me let me just dive in a little bit. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, equity crowdfunding and venture capital are two diametrically opposing systems of startup fundraising. So although uh, their customers are the same, uh, they, they're different ways to achieve the same goal. So in, intrinsically, they're both platforms. Uh, a venture capital fund is a platform. It's just a very manually operated one. It's a platform that brings in what they call LPs which are investors in the venture capital fund, and it brings in startups to invest in. But in, in essence, it is a platform. It's just a completely manual one. Uh, equity crowdfunding is an automated version of that platform. It brings in investors, uh, and it brings in startups in an automated way using the latest marketing and technology and internet connectivity and things like that, not really relying on personal networks like we just talked about, uh, not really relying on gut feelings, and all of that kind of stuff. Now, it's actually really important to realize that these are not the same uh, type of platforms uh, for, for startups to raise money, uh, but they are very, very similar in, um, in how they work. So let me share my screen. If you can give me the right to do that, that would be awesome. Working on it. I'm not sure if we can actually do this. Um, okay, well, so that's fine, that's fine. So I think, let me just start off with saying that 
Um, equity crowdfunding, EC, was, uh, was only released in 2016, Regulation CF equity crowdfunding, whereas venture capital has been around since the 1940s. Venture capital relies on a very old system of raising money, a very, I would think, an antiquated system. And the reason that I say it's antiquated is because it really hasn't evolved. Now, I'm not dumping on venture capital. I'm just saying that it's really functioning the same way now as it did in the 1940s. And this is very evident, not only in the returns, but also in just the legacy of the, of the infrastructure of that system. So if you look at how venture capital functions, there is this concept of an accredited investor. Now, in the 1930s, there was, um, there was this issue that we were having in the United States. Uh, there was a lot of swindlers. There was a lot of people lying. So Congress tried to sell securities, trying to sell stock. So Congress made a law saying that we don't want companies to get, we don't want people to get money stolen from them. So we're going to make sure that the only people who can invest in private companies, in startups, are what they called accredited investors. Now, Congress decided at the time it was really the best solution to define what somebody who's accredited, somebody sophisticated looks like. And they basically said that in order to invest in startups, you need to be a millionaire. Um, that was the safeguard that they put on so grandma wouldn't lose her house. Um, that legacy continues to present day. So if you look at the issue with having only millionaires invest in startups into private companies, is that millionaires are about 86% white males uh, in their 60s in the United States. Now, I have nothing against 60-year-old white males, but is that really the best demographic to, to predict the future of innovation? Congress in 2008 under the Obama administration said, no, this is not the best demographic. In 2008 to 2012, what Josh was talking about that period, they were introducing a set of reforms. And one of those reforms is saying, well, listen, these older white dudes are not investing into emerging companies. We need to reform that. We need to reform intrinsically how venture capital functions. So they introduced a set of reforms. One of those reforms of the Jobs Act is something that they called equity crowdfunding. Um, it's kind of a misleading term, but basically all equity crowdfunding is is introduces a set of standardizations for a startup to go through. So you need to get audits and things like that, some financial reviews, but it also, and most importantly, allows unaccredited investors, regular folks to invest in startups by buying stocks, bonds, or other security mechanisms. That has never happened before. So that monopoly that only venture capitalists had, that only millionaires had over investing in private companies, that went away overnight in 2016. So, what we see now is we see a crazy amount of volume going through the, these modern automated web enabled platforms with all of that data associated with it, with all the algorithmic trading cap capability associated with it from unaccredited investors going to early stage startups. And you can actually see that very well represented in the distribution of equity crowdfunding founders. So in equity crowdfunding, about almost 30% of the funded founders are female. About 25% of those founders are black or Latino. If you look at the venture capital world, only about 2% of the funded founders are female and less than 1% of the funded founders are black or Latino. Now, I think this is actually a really critical thing to point out that the venture capital world as a legacy, as, as a system really underrepresents minority and women founders. And I'm not talking about the 1950s. These numbers from, are not from the 1950s. When I say that 19, that one per, less than 1% of the funded founders are black or Latino, that's not an outdated number. That's 2019. That's now in the venture capital industry. So as an industry across the whole. So by letting regular people invest, they invest in a much greater diversity of founders. They also invest in a much greater diversity of ideas. Um, and it's only been around since 2016, but we've actually seen much higher returns. The equity crowdfunding industry has seen much higher returns from having a diversified group of investors um, and a diverse, diversified group of founders. And so the trends that I've been seeing, and Josh can correct me because he has more inside information that I have. All I have is anecdotal information from talking to a lot of what would have been LPs into venture capital funds, is that they like co-investing with the crowd. That seems to be an emerging trend. So rather than giving your money to a VC fund, they invest with a crowdfunding offering. Thanks, Mike. We're just gonna move to John. Uh, he hasn't had a chance to talk. We'll come back to you um, after John. We're gonna open to uh, discussion. Uh, John, 
so uh, you um, have spent a lot of time at Mass Challenge, and one of the uh, studies you've done while you were there uh, was the, the, the study that you've done showed that uh, women founders and co-founders um, are much better at um, uh, you know uh, returns that uh, their uh, male counterparts. Uh, the numbers I remember are that. For, um, women receive an average 935,000 um, of investment versus their male counterparts who receive 2.1 million of investment. However, women return um, 78 cents of revenue on every dollar invested in their startups, where the male uh, around startups uh, return only 31 cents of revenue, right? There's a big discrepancy there. So. Uh, seeing that you've used data before, you know, and, uh, and very effectively, um, can you tell us uh, how do you, do you still use data-centric approach to um, do investing? And also, uh, given these findings, you know, uh, that show diversity is really important and women uh, uh, startups uh, do better and perform better, uh, did that impact in how you run your, um, your firm? Yeah, so uh, great question. So, uh, so yes, we do use a, a fair amount of data, largely in a more manual or, I think as has been alluded to, automated manner rather than in sort of AI or machine learning or in, in a kind of a systemic um, a kind of computer driven manner. Um, and mostly we're, we use it for market sizing, economic financial modeling. We obviously check on the um, uh, LinkedIn history and backgrounds of all of the employees. We check pitch book and crunch base for uh, valuation comps and exit uh, comps and timelines. Uh, we look for other investors, et cetera. So we're definitely using lot, the plethora of data that is available to make decisions. It is still largely a manual process. And I would say the key takeaway from that research that we did together with BCG on uh, the uh, lower amount of investment dollars that are going into female founded teams despite their better revenue performance, that one of the key takeaways was for us was in, as we examined Mass Challenge is to Sanofa's point that having a diverse GP is the primary driver for making better decisions uh, that are more informed and that take multiple viewpoints. It's sort of obvious in a way, uh, but so I specifically went out and, and sought only female uh, GP partners. And so I brought on board, she's been working with me for the entire time I've been setting up the fund. But my, my first official uh, general partner uh, is female uh, investor. And I did that very consciously. And I have another one lined up that I believe I will hire once we raise a little bit more money. But I think diversity in the GP is the key driver because you're bringing in multiple uh, viewpoints. And uh, you know, obviously, I don't have too much against white men, given that I am a white man. Uh, but I, I must acknowledge that clearly, uh, I, I don't, I'm not smarter than everybody else together. And I'm not smarter. Uh, than other people from different backgrounds. So I benefit from surrounding myself with diverse opinions and input. Um, and so I guess to that point, we, we do leverage data. We're doing it largely uh, manually. And I think the key thing is to surround yourself with a diversity of opinions and diversity of uh, thought leaders, and then make uh, thoughtful decisions together uh, based on all the data that you have at your disposal uh, so that you can overcome biases built into the system I think to Sanofa's point as well, the current data sets are themselves very biased because they are based on a system that was almost exclusively white male uh, up until very recently. So you can't rely solely on the data and there still is a lot of art in addition to the science that takes place. Uh, but uh, you have to make those, um, those key moral judgments together as a team and, and therefore it's just very, very smart to surround yourself with diverse people. Okay, great, thank you, John. All right, so let's uh, have a little more mixed discussion. Um, see, Francesco, um, I'm curious if you've seen, I know you, you're tracking uh, companies that are using data-centric approach um, uh, and you're publishing that list every year. Um, in your opinion, like what are some of the companies, maybe you can pick one, that is really leading the way? Um, I, I mentioned one um, in my introductory slides. Um, do you have any other suggestions where they really um, heavily invested in using not maybe machine learning, but maybe automation uh, in their um, 
you know, in their deal sourcing uh, um, or, you know, due diligence or any other part of their process? Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, just to, just to like restate this thing and to come back to uh, Sanofi's point before, uh, I don't think that there is anyone automatically investing out of an algo right now. I mean, all of us in different forms, different shapes, different ways are doing what Veronica was doing before. What, 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 uh, what, what sorry, what um, Erica was, uh, was saying before. Uh, so it's most like augmentation of what our daily job consists of. It's nothing more than that. And uh, in terms of funds that are working in this space, um, there is a good, a good bunch of different funds trying to do something different from others. So you can, you can look at, well, one of the very first one that was using some sort of like analytics approach. Uh, I can't tell you much more about what they're really doing because I don't know what they're doing behind the curtain. So it might be everything or anything, right? But Correlation Venture back in San Diego, uh, they started doing this stuff years ago. Uh, Signal Fire, as you were mentioning before in your slide, is another fund working mostly on talent. Uh, there is one fund in London that is called Enrich Ventures that uh, before even fundraising for the proper fund, they spend, I think, two or three years building like the proper platform, like building everything from scratch, uh, from data collection to uh, automation of specific steps within like, the investment process. Um, and there is another fund in, in the States, I think in San Francisco called uh, Tribe Capital, that uh, it's instead working more on um, automating the, uh, well, they're finding data-driven ways to assess product market fit of the companies, which is a very specific application of, you know, like data-driven analysis. Uh, Ulu Venture is using more data to create market mapping uh, and competitive landscape. So honestly, like, I think that in terms of data, you can do whatever you want in different way. I think that like probably the only thing that you shouldn't do right now is trying to create something that, as we were saying before, that invests automatically as you do like in edge fund. Uh, well, like edge funds invest in public companies usually, right? But well, usually. But uh, public data and public markets are a completely different spectrum of opportunities, companies, and data. And uh, they, they, they shouldn't be mixed that much with private companies where, uh, you have a complete set of different issues, honestly. I think you're still on mute, Ned. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, this question would be for our VC and our panel. Um, I'm curious uh, if one of you could answer. Um, um, so, so we have um, you know, a lot of other uh, players, uh, you know, investing and. Um, for example, we have um, multifamily offices, um, half of them in U US are um, investing directly. 83% uh, of single family offices are investing directly. 30% of high net worth individuals in the US are self-directed investors. Um, so how could you continue to like, you know, uh, justify overall, when you look at the overall picture of returns and of the VC industry long term, um, the you know current carry and current um, the fees when you you are having all these other alternatives and faced with with the returns that we are facing, um, where do you see VC industry? Um, do you see it growing? Do you see it changing? Uh, because there's certainly other alternatives, and uh, you know people with money are moving away from VCs and doing their own investments. Somebody can pick on that. So the viability of VC going forward, next 10 years. I'm happy to jump on that one. I feel like I answer that question a lot because we're just wrapping up a raise. <laughs> um, so we, it's still an actively managed asset. And I think that that is one of the key differentiators. I think that VC, the way that it has been done um, is definitely a drying field, but there's room for that actively managed asset class, then we have a lot of family offices and individuals that have come into our fund that lean on us for that aspect of it. And I think that as you move forward, you're gonna to start to see a more welcoming table, especially in the earlier stages. I think family offices have started to fill in the gap because VCs have largely been 
very risk averse to the early stages. And so they've come to fill in where a VC would usually do that first one and a half million dollars or so. Family offices are starting to fill that gap between the angel groups and the VCs. And so it's more of a symbiotic relationship sooner. And that's really for the health of the companies. If you, again, that diversity always helps. And so having people from different backgrounds on your cap table also helps. I also think that as you move forward, family offices that have recently created generational wealth, especially in the US, are looking for um, similar people to manage their assets. And so that doesn't look like a traditional financial planner all the time when someone just created a lot of wealth out of tech and is looking to help other people. That, that sleeve doesn't quite exist yet at Morgan Stanley. And so they're still gonna be looking to this space to diversify that. I, I agree, and I would add a little bit. So, they, so I agree that it's a, it's a very actively managed uh, asset class. It does require some money to spend on operational expenses, on salaries, et cetera. There's an enormous amount of work that goes into doing diligence on the many, many startups that come through. And so I find as a small fund, we're only you know target of 20 plus million dollars, that those fees are very palatable to the, to the family offices and, and folks involved, recognizing that you need to earn money uh, to do the work and that the work is significant and more significant than they are ready to do. Um, and, you know, early stage uh, venture has excellent returns, better than other uh, indices or other asset classes over the last 25 years, very consistently. So I think it is justifiable. Um, beyond that, we've gotten a little bit innovative and we've tried to offer some additional uh, benefits for LPs to offset some of the fees. So one is that we'll offer co-investment SPVs at lower fee structures. So at one in 10, instead of the more classic two and 20. And that means that investors can put some money into the fund and then get opportunities teed up for them in high value investments at much lower fees. So they don't have to do all the diligence. We've done that. We'll prep the diligence deck for them and, 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 that, and they get that at a lower fee. And then in addition, uh, we recycle in any options or other elements that we get to offset uh, their fees. And then on the point of you know, multi-generational family offices, we have a few scenarios where the, where the younger generation would like to get involved in venture, but doesn't yet have the experience. And so we'll have them join as LPs and help kind of hold their hand through a couple of the investments and teach them the ropes of the business so that they really learn a lot about it. So they can be prepped and ready for later on to actually go in and do direct investments, uh, but where they can kind of piggyback and, and watch along as we do this round. So I still think there's a lot of value that, that we're adding at least, and I think that most venture funds can add, and it's still certainly worth the fees uh, for many of the family offices and individuals. Uh, Josh, what about you? Uh, how do you contrast, you know, your platform's approach where, you know, it's a, um, you know, very democratized way of, of investing in any company you want. Um, there's no active management. Um, so what are the benefits that you provide that, um, you know, VCs can't uh, in this particular case? What is your edge? Yeah. Um, well, you know, first off, we, we don't recommend investments to the general public. So as a platform, what we do is we evaluate the companies to make sure that they're within compliance, uh, within the regulation. Um, and, you know, we sniff out any bad deals that obviously don't fall within uh, the rules. And then it's the general public's decision as to whether or not they want to make an investment in that company or not. And all the information that they need to make that decision is publicly available for them to see. Um, you know, I think some of the advantages that companies will receive when they come to start engine is first and foremost, the entrepreneurs, they set their own terms for the offering. And so they're selling securities that they themselves have set. Generally that's going to be, they're selling common shares, at a valuation that is, you know, what they determine and what they've given Start Engine for uh, as a reasonable basis. So it's very, very friendly terms for the small businesses. They're not giving up board seats. They're not losing control of their company. The uh, one of the other advantages is if you're able to raise successfully, you're going to bring on a large number of investors, and so you're not going to have one very big concentrated investor that's going to have tons of influence over the company. Instead, you're going to spread that out over potentially thousands of individuals. And those thousands of in individuals and investors become the most passionate brand ambassadors for the company. They actually go and tell their friends and their communities about the company that they're invested in. If they're consumer facing, they go and they buy the product. 
you know, some people say that equity crowdfunding maybe isn't strategic. Well, we've actually learned that it's a lot more strategic than people think. If you're going to have 2,000 plus shareholders, what's the likelihood that one of those individuals knows somebody in a space that that company wants to enter into? It's, you know, not, it's pretty high, I'd say. So we've actually seen this, these investors are opening doors for these companies that maybe they didn't have access to before. And then obviously, if you're successful, you have a large number of investors, you know, all this other benefits that that brings, but marketing is such a big part of this. So your brand equity is going to just improve dramatically during the race. So many more people are going to know about you, are going to see your brand, and, um, and it puts you in just a, a much stronger position that by the end of the offering, you know, and you, you have the money that you are, were seeking out, but you have so many other things that come at the same time where, you know, a, a venture capital firm that, that writes you the check, um, you'll get the money, but you aren't going to have those secondary benefits that I just alerted, alluded to. So those are some of the benefits that we're seeing and hearing from the entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and I think Michael is a, a perfect example of somebody to ask. He's been down this road. He's raised on our platform. He's raised in other avenues before. And I think hearing from Michael as to, you know, why did you decide to do this? What were the benefits that you saw um, is, is something that a lot of people will be interested in hearing. Okay. Um, well, Mike, you want to, let, let me ask Erica quickly, but I do want to hear this answer from Mike. Um, and uh, before this, Josh, do you think that uh, incentives um, are better aligned in your, uh, on your platform with your approach between entrepreneurs and investors than between VCs and invest and uh, entrepreneurs? I, I believe so. Uh, I might be a little bit biased. You know, the, 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 the VCs are, are, have an obligation to make their investors money. So that's where the focus and their attention lies. Our platform is to help the entrepreneurs secure the money that they're seeking, and, and we give them the control. So uh, I think from the entrepreneurial standpoint, uh, we are you know, more aligned with those founders to help them succeed, uh, whereas the VCs are obviously, they have their models and they need to make their investors money, so that's going to be their approach. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's, just a, it's a different approach. So I'd love to hear from Mike about his experience uh, with crowdfunding. But right before that, I'd like to ask Erica because she only had one question so far. Erica, um, so when I look at your board, um, there's about 30, 33% of women on the board. Am I right? Some, somewhere around there? Yeah, around there in terms of our investment team. Correct. But when I look at all of the cohort you have today, you have – only about 18% of startups where a woman is a co-founder, only one where she's a founder, but the rest where she's a co-founder. So there is a discrepancy in those numbers. Um, can you tell us why they might be, and uh, do you see that number going up in the future? And what, do you, what is your company doing to uh, improve that percentage? Yeah, so for sure, I think I think you're right about about a third of the fact that the investment team is is female, and actually, you know, we are working to eventually make it around fifty percent. That's kind of like a internal goal goal for ourselves. Um, and in just in addition to to that, I would say most of the team, so over fifty percent of the team, is actually either first generation or immigrant. So we we certainly are very proud of that, and um, it's it's something that we value um, in terms of having good representation across the team. Um, I think, you know, the pattern to break, you know, that we think about all the time is, you know, birds of a feather flock together, right? So people like people and invest in people who remind them of themselves. And in theory, um, you know, there hasn't been as much diversity in, in VC. And as, as you increase the female representation or underrepresented um, kind of investor profile for on, the, for on the investing side, it should improve the numbers. I think, um, you know, we work on it very actively. Um, time will tell as, you know, I feel like these initiatives have been, um, you know, they haven't been put into place, you know, for the past 50 years, but, you know, they have been certainly um, more recently. I'm pretty deliberate when I, when I look at, so me being a female, me being a minority, um, me being first generation, I'm pretty deliberate when I search for founders. I have, um, you know, for women in particular. So, um, you know, I have a million Google lists, I scrape from forums, you know, Slack chats, dinners, groups, um, you know, awareness, you know, hopefully leads to action, which eventually will hopefully lead to, lead, uh, lead to outcome. 
Um, but yeah, no, it's something that we value at Survey. We're constantly working at it. Um, and, you know, only improvements to come. Thanks, Erica. Um, okay, Mike, so can you uh, follow on the, um, what Josh was talking about, your experience with uh, crowdfunding? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my, the, the company that I run now called Geo Orbital, we're, as far as I know, the first company to have raised over a million dollars in rewards crowdfunding, in our case on Kickstarter, and over a million dollars in equity crowdfunding, in our case on Start Engine, Josh's company. Um, I'm very proud of that. I think it's actually quite a significant accomplishment. Now, I think one of the big misnomers, and I have raised, by the way, for, from VC across several companies and things like that. I, the, the challenge that I have with, um, with VC versus EC, uh, venture capital versus equity crowdfunding, is that VC is a much more labor intensive process. Um, for me. It's a lot of work. So yes, all the VCs will say it's a lot of work for them. And it is because it's all gut feelings is getting to know people. I mean, the most valuable part of doing diligence uh, on a startup for a venture capital, especially at the early stage, is getting to know the founders. Uh, that's a lot of work. It's relationship building. And it's a lot of work for the startup as well. Um, and it's work that doesn't really apply to any other segment of your business. Um, yes, you get, you, you, you make friends, you go have coffee, you reply to each other's emails in the middle of the night, that kind of thing, but it's really not replicatable. What Josh said with, with crowdfunding, whether it's rewards crowdfunding, like Kickstarter, which by the way, has put in over $3 billion into the hands of early stage startup founders, which is massive by far larger than any VC fund by far, um, or start engine, which has also put tons of cash into the hands of startups. Uh, is that the effort that you put into raising on those platforms is replicatable. It is applicable to other things that you're doing within the business. So it's best marketing practices. It's like Josh said, building brand equity. It's getting thousands and thousands of ambassadors and advocates that support your company. Now, I don't think it's necessarily the, a right fit for every type of company, um, but it is an amazing way to raise money. So the reason that, the reason that I chose and to do equity crowdfunding is because of that. It's, it's automated, you're using modern tools, you're using, you can use Facebook ads, you can publicly solicit. There's a ton of technical reasons why it's better for the founder, um, outside of setting terms, like Josh mentioned, not giving up board seats, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it is in essence much more founder friendly than any type of angel investment would be, um, or a grouped angel investment, like an angel group or a venture capital investment. But in, an additional reason that I think it's, it's actually kind of problematic is that these two systems are just not compatible right now. So a startup that raises through EC will have a lot of friction in raising through VC because these are competing platforms. These are competing mechanisms. Uh, most venture capitalists are very resistant to equity crowdfunding for, for I think, good reason, because it's very threatening to the model. Um, as far as, and I mean, one of, one of my main things is that I, I, I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I see is honestly minority and female entrepreneurs. They just don't have access to angel or venture capital funding, especially at the early stage when the diligence process is getting to know a person. That's basically what it is. Uh, minorities don't have those networks that allow them to get to the VCs. Minorities don't have the same background. So somebody talked about having LinkedIn profiles and sharing those. A lot of the, some of the startups I work with, the founders don't have LinkedIn profiles because it's honestly not a typical thing to do. And it's not, it's a silly thing to look at when you're looking at potential for investment. And I mean, if you look at research, just because they're women GP or people on the investment committee, it doesn't make them much more likely to invest in women led companies. People internalize biases, no matter who you are. I, I can, I can be, you know, I can be sexist if I'm female just as well. So it's not, I know we have all these shortcuts for trying to get to equity, not equality, but equity uh, in, our, in, in our decision making, but there are unconscious biases. They are what they call blind spots uh, in our thinking. And my biggest reason is, let's say, let's look at the VC industry as, as an industry. And again, I, I, I love the industry, but I think it's, it's just a little bit misapplied. Um, if you have less than 1% of the people invested in, in that industry being black or Latino, and you expand that to any other industry that we're comfortable with, like let's say Microsoft had less than 1% of employees being black or Latino. 
we would all get together and ban and boycott Microsoft. We're like, Microsoft, you're stupid. People inside of Microsoft would say, this is stupid, guys. We're ignoring a lot of excellent people, right? We need to change our policies. We have an internal huge issue. Not only Microsoft would do that internally, but everybody externally to Microsoft would do that as well. But the venture capital industry hasn't had that moment of introspection. Um, and it should. And it should by partnering with more equitable, with more democratic ways to raise money, like equity crowdfunding. And there's others as well. But that is why I chose equity crowdfunding. I honestly think it's the future of investment. I also think for the investor, there's more information available. Like Josh said, there are audits. There are legal reviews that happen. Um, if there is fraud committed or something shady, the SEC is going to crack down on you. It's serious, right? You don't lie with equity crowdfunding. Whereas with private, with private placements like the reg deeds that the VCs run, you do lie. And, it and fraud is a major concern for both LPs, VCs, whoever in that industry. It's, it's, it's much rarer. Right? As far as I know, it's unheard of in the equity crowdfunding industry for now anyway. So I think it's a, it's a more modern way to raise money. I think it's more, more founder friendly in the respect that you set the terms, you, know, you, um, you kind of control the raise. Um, but I also think from a venture capitalist perspective, it's a better way to invest as well. Because not only do you have access to more data, more standardized data that you can analyze and extrapolate from, but you can also, like I said, co-invest with the crowd. You see a thousand people of all different walks of life investing in an idea. That's a huge signal that an idea is worth something. Much stronger of a signal than you know a couple of experts uh, that you've hired um, deciding it. You know this is worth pursuing. So that's the reason I went with it. I actually think it's the future. Um, uh, fundraising and I think some kind of a hybrid model and there are some you know emerging between venture capital and equity crowdfunding um, is the way to go I think in five years the default and I mean the default for a company starting is you're going to become a c-corp you're going to incorporate day one and you're going to raise your crowdfunding offering I call it the evergreen raise I actually wrote a book called the evergreen startup specifically about this um, and then with venture capital is ready to come in they'll come in but honestly, a startup should be selling securities from day one, from the moment they incorporate. That is just such something possible uh, in, the, in the venture capital model now, but it's entirely possible with equity crowdfunding. So that's, that's my vision of the future. I think my company is early to the game because, I mean, when we started doing this, this was much rougher and, um, I mean, there was, there was a lot more issues, uh, right, that, were, that weren't really worked out. But in five years, I think it's going to be the default for an early stage startup. And then maybe uh, they'll raise for venture capital later on, or maybe venture capitalists will invest in their public offering and uh, their reg CF in this case offering. So that's why I did it personally. And I've been very happy with the decision. Like I said, I've raised, I think 1.7 million just with equity crowdfunding alone. Um, thousands of advocates and advisors. And like Josh said, yes, tons of introductions to potential customers to potential partners, all that kind of stuff. And most importantly, the effort that I put in into my equity crowdfunding offering, I can use it in other parts of the business as well. Thanks, Mike. All right, well, so we're, um, it's been an hour since the start. So this is the time where we wrap up and get some uh, questions from the audience. But before we do that, I'd like every uh, speaker to, um, you know, for 30 seconds say, um, what is their vision for venture capital industry over the next five to 10 years? Where do, tell, tell us one thing, one, one change that you see uh, or you envision will happen with the industry over the next five to 10 years. Um, let's see, let's go from, uh, um, Francesco, you wanna go first? Sure, uh, I will probably like to uh, connect to what Michael was, was just discussing, uh, saying that uh, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure that everything is gonna be like crowdfunding or, or, or VC either. It's probably like something in between where like the two player coexist. Uh, what, I, what I want to point out is that the only reason why VC is and the only reason why we are even like today here talking about it, why we are using data, it's simply because, I mean, that's historically speaking, our model hasn't been scalable enough, right? And now that we have more companies that we look at, we are, we are forced to look at data to be sure that we do our job at best. Uh, I don't know if that's what equity crowdfunding is already doing by default. Uh, maybe, maybe platform are probably, 
But that's the only reason why we're looking at data. Uh, so I'm guessing that probably like in the next like five, 10 years, the ecosystem will be something mixed where you know all these players are around like finding different stages of different companies. Uh, and where like there is much, much more data available like to, uh, to back up your investment decisions. Right. All right, Josh, would you go next, please? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the regulations that allows the public to invest in private companies is called Reg A+. And right now it allows uh, businesses to raise up to $50 million from the general public. That's going to be increasing up to $75 million in the next few months. And I think what is going to be happening over the next five to 10 years are platforms like Start Engine and other equity crowdfunding platforms are gonna be working and partnering with VCs where you know, a company is gonna to come to the crowd uh, and raise maybe the first 10 million bucks or so from the general public, and then the next 30 or $40 million is gonna be funded by a VC or two VCs or three, however many. So I think that's something that you're going to see in the next five to 10 years is just these, these partnerships and these relationships form where these two different competing um, platforms can coexist together to help these small businesses raise larger sums of cash because to raise 50 to 75 million from the general public alone is very, very difficult. But to have some of those VCs on board with platforms that can put in much larger checks are going to help significantly. And so I think that's something that you're going to see in the next uh, several years. Thanks, Josh. John, would you like to go next? Sure. So, um, so I think Mike made a really passionate plea for uh, crowd investment, and I appreciate that. And I think there, it is doing well and has a strong future. I would note that it still represents at whatever eight point five billion. It's like six percent of the investment space, so it's still very niche. And I think it is better suited for very specific types of startups, most notably consumer oriented startups with either a product that is uh, beautiful or elegant in its design or has some kind of an emotional appeal. And it's not as well suited for enterprise startups or for biotech or for other uh, areas or industries in the same way. So I do think it's got a bright future and I do see the possibility of better integration with venture. But I think the future is more about having a diversity of everything, including funding sources. And I don't think, I don't see these two models as competitive per se at all. I think they both continue to grow, but they both exist. Um, and so I think you'll have more funding options available. You'll have better diversity of investments in a broader array of startups. I think you'll have the best returns ever. This is probably, in my opinion, this is the best venture vintage of all time. This, you have in mar large markets in massive disruption. You have lower valuations, lower costs for startups, uh, lots of money available on the sidelines. We're going to see significant investments and the the market leaders, the Amazons and Googles of the next 10 to 20 years are being born right now. Uh, and they are nimbler and more able to address the market challenges than uh, the established players. So I think this is a great time to be getting involved in investing in startups, whether through a crowd investment platform or a fund or, or other mechanisms as an angel. So uh, I'm mostly just bullish. I do think we'll see more data usage, more automation, but I think it will take a little time uh, for the data to sort of form and for um, the algorithms to prove themselves out. It's a long game. It takes 10, 15 years for a startup to IPO or to really have an exit. So it's difficult to prove a given hypothesis very quickly and it will take a little bit of time, but very bullish overall. And I think we can all work together to produce more innovation and a brighter and happier humanity. Thanks, Jeff. All right, Mike, your turn to close. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything uh, John said. I, equity crowdfunding is very small. It's only been around for a few years, literally since 2016, with the type that I was talking about. Um, it's, it's growing, but I agree. There, there's going to be a way for these two systems to coexist together. I think there are ways now that they can coexist together that people are working on. Um, as far as the, the lockup, the, the tenure to see an exit, actually, so I, I won't talk too much about it. I think I talked about what I think the future was going to look like, but I want to just touch on this very specific point. Part of the regulations that allowed equity crowdfunding to exist allowed the, the buyers of these securities to actually sell them on a marketplace. So if you buy a share of a startup, after holding it for a year, you can actually sell it. 
which gives you liquidity as an investor, which again is a very paradigm changing thing. Um, Start Engine, I know, had a platform at one point that it kind of went away, that I think they're working on another platform. I don't know. Josh can talk a little bit about that as a marketplace to sell those securities. But there are other, there are other platforms that allow you to actually sell it, which not only allows you to mark to market, as in allows you to kind of know what the startup is worth, what your investment is worth uh, a year down the road, which you really can't do that with alternative methods, right? You give a million bucks to a fund, you don't really know what it's worth. I mean, you have all these assumptions, but you don't really know. There's no market pr price for it. Uh, so you have to wait 10 years. You have to wait 15 years to know if anything is really working. Uh, with equity crowdfunding, it's intrinsically different. And what, that's one of the reasons that Congress made that is to protect the investor, right? Like they don't want, they don't want people to just lose all their money. So I, I think the future, like I said, is a hybrid. I think for super early stage, you know, you need your 20 grand, you need your 50 grand, you need your 100 grand, you need your million bucks. Equity crowdfunding is probably going to be the default uh, in five years. I don't think VC like the space. I, it's too cap, it's too intensive from a diligence perspective to invest, you know, in a, $20,000 round or $50,000 round. But a lot of times that's the amount of money that people need to get to the next inflection point so they can prove that their idea is worth something. So I think what's going to happen, and this is a trend that even before COVID, is VC go much later stage, just because it makes sense with their model, much later stage, you know, 50 mil, 100 mil, whatever, 20 mil and up probably, I don't know. But, and then equity crowdfunding and other mechanisms, earlier stage. Now, I haven't really seen a lot of data saying that tech facing startups are uh, that much better at raising. There's a lot of enterprise B2B companies that raise that don't have, that raise for software, that raise for hardware, that raise for biotech things. So I think as it becomes, as thought leaders, like all of us here, uh, keep talking about the tools available to an entrepreneur to raise money the more popular all of these methods will be and the more they'll find niches in the marketplace. By, from, if, if you were to talk to an entrepreneur, most people don't know about equity crowdfunding because all of the thought leadership in the space comes from VCs or angels or traditionalists. So this being such a new thing, and I bet m many people on, on this, you know, listening to this panel right now, it's the first time they've heard of it. And I think that's going to change. I think you know, thought leaders in this space are gonna keep talking more and more about this. So people are gonna become more comfortable with it. Investors will be comfortable with it and startups will be comfortable with it. So yes, like I said, I think in a few years, it's gonna be almost a default for early stage fundraising. Um, and then venture capital, whether it's co-investing or other mechanisms will also play a role in the ecosystem, but it's going to look very differently than what it does now. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, we actually went way over time uh, for the panel, but uh, I'm, uh, okay with that because it was a great discussion and, and a lot of um, questions have been answered. So we won't get uh, time to answer some of the questions from the audience. Uh, we'll just have to wrap up uh, on this note. And I want to thank everybody, um, all the panelists for attending and all the, um, all the uh, um, members uh, for watching. So thank you everyone. Hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Well, bye-bye.